It is a huge honor to be interviewing my buddy, David Rice, who the last time I saw you, we were both lecturing at uh, University of Buffalo in, uh, in Buffalo, right? We sure were. And you had so many dental students there fired up. I mean, you, you started a, uh, 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 you have the nation's largest dental student dentist network, Ignite DDS, and you maintain a practice in East Amherst, New York, and you date probably the most charismatic uh, hygienist I've ever met in my life, Anastasia Tourette. And that video you two did of you, you guys doing a song and holding up flashcards was, I mean, I was laughing out loud. I was spitting up my coffee watching that. But uh, so tell us your story. You got out of school in 94, and now it's uh, 2015. So you've been out 20 years, 19 years, right? And yep. uh, and so tell tell everybody your story and how did you – decide you were going to focus on the next generation and ignite DDS and get these kids fired up. And what, what are you doing for these kids? And how are you helping them uh, get out of school and blossom faster, easier, and quicker? So is that yes. enough questions that, that, that I'm such a horrible interviewer. What I do is I say, okay, I suck. I'll just throw 20 questions out there. Maybe one of them's good and you'll bite. So, as long as something sticks, we're all good. We're all good. Uh, gosh, let's see. So, yeah, it's 20 years ago for me, graduation from Buffalo. Went on to do a residency in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You know, I like to travel really far. So, lived there for two years. Went out west and spent some time with David Hornbrook so I could learn some cosmetically driven dentistry. I didn't know that you and David hooked up. for. Yeah, through so, Pack Live. So, you, were, you work in David's office? No, not in his practice, but just spent a lot of time out west with him, learning from him, the master. He's a talented man. Oh, yeah. When I when I got out of school and I was going to have all my amalgams replaced, I went to that guy. I mean, I, and I, and I uh, took my assistants. And, uh, yeah, he, he's an amazing man. Terrific. And he's got an amazing podcast now, uh, too. Um, he's with um, – Sean Keating at Keating Dental Labs, and now they have a podcast. And I mean, and he's doing it, you know, totally David style. He's got a a movie producer, a Hollywood producer. The guests are floated live. You know, I'm the hillbilly hick from Kansas doing it on Skype for a dollar. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So 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 you moved. So you uh, so you hated uh, Buffalo Bills, and you wanted to be a Steelers fan. And then you went out to David Hornbrook, and you became a a, a San Diego Chargers fan. So continue. So that you know, as as most do from Buffalo, New York, you, some way somehow you meander back here and sadly <laughs> become a Bills fan again. Uh, <laughs> but yes, I have the Steelers blood in me with Anastasia, and apparently she's also a Dallas Cowboys fan. I'm not sure how that works, but that's our gig. Probably because she looks like a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader. That might yeah. be that might be the deal. So is Anastasia from Pittsburgh? She's originally from Altoona, PA. Okay. So, yeah, closest major city, I would say, Pittsburgh for her. Grew up a Steelers fan. And uh, so now she's here in Buffalo, which is uh, a little painful for her because she's been down south for a while in, in the Outer Banks. But the weather here is going to be special for her in the next few months. And I'm where sure where was she down south? Was she, was she in Nashville or, or? She was Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was thought. North Carolina. Yeah. And yeah. uh, so, man, she must be in love to move from North Carolina to, <laughs> to Albany. I, I, I always thought that was interesting when Ivy Claire wanted a North American operation that they picked Amherst, New York, a suburb of Buffalo. I'm like, dude, did you not see Florida on the map? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did you have one of those old ancient European maps that only uh, only covered the Boston uh, Plymouth Rock? But uh, but but everybody seems to like it up there and love it up there and stays up there. It's, you know, it's a great place to um, launch from. However, uh, Gary Takis reminds me all the time as a former Clevelander, it's a great place to be from. So we'll see what happens in life. Who said that? Gary Takis. He's from, he's from Albany? He's from Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, I did not know that. And now yeah. he's up the street from me. Yeah, rub that in the next time you see him for lunch. I'm in the poor, uh, I'm in the poor Phoenix area and Gary's in the rich uh, Scottsdale area. That's about right for Gary, right? <laughs> oh. Uh, so, yeah, moved back here, started a practice, actually bought a practice. Small world, you'll know Mike Gaglio from Ivo Clark. Absolutely. So I bought Mike's practice 17 years ago or so. Really? Yep, small world. And um, we've had a wonderful relationship with Ivo Clark, and that's probably been a, a, a huge help to me to get in front of different people around the country because they got an opportunity to see the dentistry we did and it really just because they were down the road and thankfully they liked what we did so that's how the speaking and teaching began and 
and I, I, I landed with students and young dentists, quite frankly, because they're just my favorite people in the world. I, I love every minute of working with them. Love I know. I, I get paid handsomely to lecture, but I always do it for free at dental schools, and I like the free ones I do at dental school more so than uh, uh, the ones you get paid for because they're just bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and I, when I look back at my dental school experience, if it wasn't for my next door neighbor, Kenny, who just spent a gazillion free volunteer hours with me answering every question in his dental office from sixth grade to the end of dental school. And then in dental school, it was the part-time instructors who came in and they were getting paid like what, $200 a day. And you know, they could have stayed in their office and done one occlusal from <laughs> eight to 8.30 and gone home. And they'd come in there and work all day for the price of an occlusal. And, but they were tethered to the real world and they were the most exciting people of University of Missouri, Kansas City, whereas all the academics, kind of an institutional structured thing. And man, the, the, the volunteer, in fact, one of my friends, Tim Taylor crushes it from Monday to Thursday, but he works in the local dental school on Friday and same thing, the money's a pittance, but he says that that's his most fun day of the week. Yeah. And whenever you go to the bar and, and have a beer with him and watch a game and he starts talking about dentistry, he only talks about his one day a week that he gets paid for an occlusal filling at the <laughs> at university at AT Still Dental School, and he never even brings up his dental office. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, that, that young people just have fun energy. That's why I have so much fun living at my house because three of my four boys, uh, you know, they all had moved out, gone to college, and all that. But one by one, the three of them came back. One got married, but just having that much raw testosterone in the house, you know, twenty, twenty-two, and a twenty-four-year-old, the whole house is just exciting again, you know. Uh, but uh, so so, what do you what what exactly are you what what exactly detailed is Ignite DDS and what do you and what are you exactly trying to accomplish with these kids? Yeah, so my focus is I guess what I've learned over the last twenty years teaching part time is you know they're missing the same things you and I were missing when we were in school. So they learn very little about how to run a business. They they have a massive debt today, far more than I ever had. Um, very little about communicating with patients and with team leadership and some of the technology is limited depending on the school too either because the school can't afford it or there may not be someone on faculty who knows how to use it so we try to bring all those elements to the table and my goal is really just to give them a 10-year jump start on life that you know I didn't have and and so what what kind of student loan debt are you seeing uh, you, so you work uh, how many days a week do you work in the Albany Dental School so I, I'm, I'm actually formally not at the dental school in Buffalo any longer. Um, I'm probably with that student group maybe twice a month just because it's home, quote, home court for me. But uh, I'm in my practice three days, and then if I'm not in Buffalo, I'm at a school somewhere. How, how, are you, how, how, there's 56 dental schools. How many schools are you working with? About forty-five of them right now. Holy moly, dude! You are the, you are a busy man. So you live in an airplane then? Essentially, yes. Anastasia likes that though. Travel is fun, so. Huh? Yeah, I I, I love it um, international, but going back to Cleveland for the fifteenth time is you know you know you don't say that, oh I get to go back to Tulsa you know <laughs> but you know going to Australia and all those places are fun. So what do you when you go into a dental school? What is it? Is it a half day program an all day program? What, how long is the program? Awesome question. It really it depends on the school. Um, so I work directly with the students. Sometimes it's a half a day. Sometimes it's a full day, and occasionally it's an evening seminar for you know two hours. So it's it's different everywhere. It just depends on student group, venue, how many times we've worked together, whether we have an online component or it's purely a live component. So it's and, different. And or is this mostly an American play, or do you throw in Canada since Buffalo technically is Canadian, since they're going to buy your football team anyway? We've got that Labatt's Blue six-pack downtown, so I feel very drawn to Canada now. I think it's funny how every time the owner gets upset, he always says he's going to sell the team to Canada. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, but but is, or is it mostly U.S.? Are you doing Canada or other countries? It's, it's mainly U.S. in the moment. However, we're, um, we've got some people interested in Canada as well as Rome and a few other places. So we'll see. It's just about time right now. Well, you know, um, if you've got a two- or three-hour lecture, when I look at the um, – um, dental Town's got 205,000 members, and when we print them out by, uh, you know, a lot of the kids in dental school, they all have their dental school email address. So my team can and can see where the emails are coming from. But we have a lot of dental students from over 200 dental schools. So awesome. so if you put a um, if you put a online C course for Ignite DDS, uh, all that, you you'd be talking to dental students in probably every continent but Antarctica. 
that would be amazing. I would love to do that. Yeah, that that'd, that'd be amazing. So so let's so what kind of a student loan debt are these kids coming out with? It's it's interesting because you know how it works. A D and the ADA they'll throw out numbers like. 250, but I'll, I've never been in a room where the average was less than 325, and I'm in a lot of rooms where it's 400, 450, 500 thousand dollars. But but that number is kind of very misleading because um that's just of the people that have student loans. I mean, there's a lot of kids whose dad's a dentist. I mean, when I was in dental school, a third of the class, my my roommate, yeah. uh, his, his dad was a dentist, his grandfather was a dentist. It was all all paid for, including the car, the rent, the electricity. What what percent have no debt because their dad's a dentist? That, that's the million dollar question, right? There's there's probably about 15% who have little to no debt because mom and dad. 15%? But um, the, the numbers, like you said, the numbers get so skewed because most of these kids are rolling out with massive numbers and it's getting offset by mom and dad on the other small percentage. And, I, and the million dollar question is actually really is how much is the average student loan debt and then how much is the average divorce settlement for the dentist first divorce? I still think the student loan debt is going to be only 25% of their total of their total debt when compared to their divorce. Uh, so uh, do, do you coach them on that, a prenuptial? Do you just have an hour on a prenuptial agreement? I, I really should because I've walked that path. So I know. <laughs> That's what we should do. We should get all the divorce dentists on Dental Town to rewrite your Ignite DDS course. Say, hey, forget everything uh, David's telling you. This is what you need to – this is what needs to be covered in a prenuptial. And uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh no, no, I'm never bitter about my alimony because uh, the, she gave me four of the most amazing kids in the world, and for that, awesome. for that, I'd pay it tenfold. But so, so then the million dollar question is this, really? So if you're walking out of school with three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in debt, and 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 everybody's throwing marketing at you that you need to buy a hundred fifty thousand dollar Serona um, a Serac machine from Serona Dent Supply, you need to buy. $100,000 CBCT from Galileo, Serona, or CareStream, or iCat. You need to buy a $75,000 BioLace laser. What, what do you tell them about the toys? Yeah. I mean, monkeys like shiny objects. You're never, that's, that's never going to go away. I mean, no, they just love shiny objects. Yes, they do. And, <laughs> and as much as you and I tell them, don't go buy all the shiny objects, they're going to buy some anyway. But, uh, you know, I tell them it's it, it, dentistry. Your practice is a business. You have to have a business plan. You have to look at cash flow. You have to look at your ability, your viability as a business. So it's take a step backwards, develop a vision of where you want to be in two years, five years, ten years, and, and understand that the whole world is something to sell you. It may make sense for you today. It may make sense in five years. And it may not make sense for you at all, as shiny as it is. What 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 are you in your program? What 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 are your what is your low hanging fruit takeaway points for for these students? I mean, what what do you try to get them focused on? Business, obviously, but more specific. What do you, what do you tell them? Yeah, we're you know we just launched um, a program right uh, about two weeks ago called Crush. So it's really five strategies as a as a new dentist that can help accelerate your path. So. The seeing crush is all about continuing your education and you know my own experience I think the experience of many dentists is the more you know the more you're gonna be able to do in your practice every day and so many dentists you know they're not doing endo they're not doing surgery they don't know how to do this they don't know how to do that so they're they're sending everything out the door or, or maybe just from a treatment planning standpoint they're not seeing everything they should be seeing so we we start off talking about how do you expand your education so you can expand your services. I think that's going to be huge in dentistry as time goes on. The models come full circle. The GP is really running the show again. Um, that's, I guess, our first of five pieces that we focus on. I, I agree. I mean, I, 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 I tell everybody I can that, you know, I, I've been out three decades. I've been out 28 years. And going back, all the dentists who, like, signed up to, um, to get, like, their FAGD, and start committing to like 100 hours a seat or more, whether they got their FAGD there. But I look back, all the dentists that were friends of mine that uh, devoured 100 hours a seat a year, they ended up doing, all their dreams came true. And yeah. all and whenever in this big city of Phoenix with 3,800 dentists, whenever you go to a, a, a study a CE course, it's the same 100 people. Yeah. And they're all happy and healthy and functional and have friends and and they're, they're so yeah, so, so a, so getting out of dental school and realize that your education just begins the day you graduate and everything they taught you, algebra, trig, and physics, and all that shit was just 
the barrier you had to pass to get into the tribe and it was all useless and um yeah so ce have, do, you, do you recommend a diet of so many hours do you recommend a number you know i don't have a set number it's interesting because as i sit down and talk to them most of them get it, it and even if and even to the tune of if it's a um a postgraduate program of some sort but a lot of them they're like so dave how do i how do i write that check for the great ce when i'm just moving back in with mom and dad to afford my my loan payment and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on Friday. So, I, you know, I, I kind of start them all off and tell them occlusion's huge. If you're going to be a restorative dentist, you need a foundation. You know, make sure you can do endo. The future's going to be about placing implants if it's not here already. And um, take as much as you can take. And I, I think your experience, what you said earlier, holds true. You're going to see the same 100 people in the room, and the more CE you take, the more you're going to find a way to keep taking more. Well, that that's at, uh, that's the only reason I started these uh, doing these podcasts because I realized that um, you know if they do a hundred hours a year um, every year, so you know I'm 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 doing that and and I I try to get the best implantologists, endodontists. I'm trying to cover the full spectrum on everything because they're they're driving to work, they don't have a dime, and a podcast is an hour, and that's the average commute. And I'm 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 trying to if I can make it fast, easy, free, high quality with speakers from around the world yeah. that they'll just, if they just get this little habit of listening to Dennis from here to Kathmandu for an hour, it, the next thing you know, they'll have so many right answers in their head, they'll just fall into success. That, that, that was my, my whole goal. Um, so what would be number two besides CE? CE, I, number two would be for me is relationships win and, and no. life is about relationships. Every business is about relationships and understanding who who you you know, who's in your community, who are you trying to attract, who that patient is sitting across from you. Sometimes, you know, we learned dental speak very well in school, but that's not what a patient understands. So understanding a new language, uh, a different skill set to help patients get what they want, what they need, is so, so very helpful. Um, you know, Gary and I have talked a lot about DISC and a lot about... Gary uh, Takis? Gary Takis, yeah. Oh, when you say, when you guys talk a lot, you mean on on his podcast or does he lecture with you or um, a few of his podcasts and we've touched base probably just every few months to say hey how's it going because he's over at Midwestern's dental school right uh, on a part-time basis so you know we're always talking strategy but he's just doing that for the money I mean they, <laughs> they pay him they pay him a couple hundred thousand dollars a year just to work one day a week well he's gifted <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that speaks volumes of a person when they always want to give back in a dental school I love it I love it so it's and you know, I think. But anyway, some, I, I'm sorry, I interrupted. But you and Gary talk once a week about what the, the the relationship side. We talk about the relationship side, and and you know, how is it that you sit down with the patient and understand, you know, who wants dentistry a tooth at a time, and and who wants all their dentistry today, and and everybody in between. How do you figure that out? So that for me is um, a big part of our education because you're going to offend some people if you give them that whole big chunk and you're going to offend other people if you don't tell them the whole story. So helping a patient the way they want to be helped, I think is very, very important. But I, I want to stop right there because I, you know, I believe that, you know, um, when I started school, I truly believed in 1980 that if I mastered physics and chemistry and, and algebra and trig and it'd be the answers to the universe. And now here I am, you know, lived half a century and never used any of that shit once. And, yep. and I look at all success is the people who are gifted in people skills. So, so you're, you're, you, the problem with dentistry, you have this abnormal, um, um, abnormal uh, um, group of people that nobody could enter the club unless they got A's in all these sciences. So yep. you're getting all the geeks from the library. And whereas if you would have um, entered them all on who won a karaoke contest, we <laughs> might not be having this conversation. If, if it was the smartest bartender contest, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. So, so it's abnormal uh, selection. Um, so, how do you? Is there any reading material courses? How do you try to train a scientist, an engineer, a mathematician, someone who knows that glucose shits out twenty three ATPs in a Krebs cycle? How do? How would you educate that person? What would you recommend to where they can be more touchy feely, intuitive, listen, feel, communicate? Because that's that's the whole game. And, and, the, and, the, and you know what the dentists tell me, point blank? You know, you'll tell them about this course. Oh, that's fluff bullshit. I want to learn how to bone graft. Yep. 
And you're like, they, they, they don't even know what they don't know. They don't even know that that should be 80% of their CE should be relationship skills, you know. And if you can't keep your wife, you can't keep your staff, you're not going to keep your patients. I mean, it's, it's all the same thing. It sure is. And, so, and then when you read through the newspaper, it's all people stuff. I mean, religion yeah. is just people. Government's just organizing people. Business is just organizing people. I mean, it's that's that's all I see is just it's all relationship issues. I mean, there's nothing different between reading the New York Times and watching um, the Orange Wife, Housewives of Beverly Hills, Miami, Atlanta, whatever the hell. It's just all the same thing. Yeah, it In is. fact, football is the most stupid because you want your team to beat the other team just because they have a different uniform on. I mean, there's there's not even an issue why you're fighting. You know, they're just fighting for the sake of fighting. Uh, but uh, so so what? How would you? What would be the diet course of information to learn this stuff? I start off most of the groups we work with with DISC. I think it's a simple DISC. System. Yeah, DISC. So it's a behavioral style assessment, and we usually run a. That's about a three hour workshop that we run live. We we flip the classroom so we have everybody take an assessment online before we come to their school. They have a little bit of background. And it's what's really fun is you take those geeks in the one corner and you take the socialites in another corner and you take the Donald Trumps in another corner and the really soft-spoken people and, and we show them how easy it is for us to butt heads and how simple it is to, to screw up. And then after that course, we talk to them a lot about um, Gallup's Strength Finders because some of those... Like you said, Gallup, some of the, Gallup Strength Finders. Strength Finders, yeah. That, that's so, a book or a website or what is that? So uh, Gallup is uh, a big research company, and they put out out of Nebraska, aren't they? Yeah, out of Nebraska, yeah, and right they on. have um, Strength Finders. They have a 2.0 version, and the one I like to work with students on is Strength Finders for Leaders. So wow, yeah, that's a solid book. It's an easy read. Same thing. It's a simple assessment. So what is, I is that written by a single person, or is that just put out by Gallup? It's um, there were a couple authors. Rath was one, and I'm losing the other gentleman's name, but they they collated all of Gallup's content for the last 40 years, and um, essentially dispelled the myth that the greatest leaders in the world were well-rounded. You know, they said the greatest leaders in the world are not well-rounded. They're excellent at what they do. They focus on their strength, and then they hire around them. So if I'm the dentist who has trouble with people because that's just not my gig, then, then I need to understand that and, and build my team of people who are social and, make that, and let them make that happen with me or for me. You know, I, I, um, I actually have to credit my dad for that one because my dad, I'll never forget a phone call I got from my dad and he said, did you see that? Did you see that? I said, why? And he goes, McDonald's went up an eighth. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And he goes, that son of a bitch, Ray Kroc, died. He's dead, and his company's still going, and the stock's going up. It didn't even blink. This guy is managing from the grave, and most dentists are standing in the middle of the dental office and can't even manage their own this or, in his world, restaurants and everything. So, so it, for me, it, from day one, it was not only just hiring people to compliment what I was not good at or interested in or wanted to do, but it was finding someone to replace me. I mean, my... My first two employees were uh, an associate dentist and a president and an office manager. And I said, so I was, I was preparing to manage from the grave at day one because I knew that 100% of us will end up in the grave. And the, and the faster you get to seeing that big picture, and, and then the problem I have with 40-year-old dentists, they won't even delegate to their assistant to make a damn CIRAC. Right. They're over there scanning and drawing the line. And it's like, are you kidding me? You used to set a rubber impression to a lab that sent it to China some chick speaking Mandarin Chinese is making it, but you won't let your dental assistant do it? Are you a monkey? I mean, so you can't get them to delegate their CIRAC. You can't get them to delegate office manager, everything. So, yeah, that, that, that's, that's interesting, the strength finders, that they just find what am I good at, and if I'm not good at it, I'm going to find someone who's good at it. And then in my case, I find out what I'm good at, and then I find someone who's better at it. Yes. Like my president of my company, Lori Zlowski, she's a far better president than I'd ever be. And so she's had the job for 18 years. Awesome. Yeah, and she yeah. just likes, and that's why I lecture so much because they love it when I'm not only out of the city, but they love it when I'm out of the country. You notice most of my gigs are like Australia, England, Africa. They, yeah. they love it when I'm going to be gone for like a week. Nice, nice. Well, you know what? It's, and you, you raised a really good point talking about the older dentists too. And, and what you've done is 
build that team, you know, exit strategy wise, how many dentists do you see? You see far more than I've ever seen who, you know, they're 65, 67, 72, and they have no idea how they're going to get out of dentistry. And what I don't understand is the, the one selling their offices. I mean, when you tell me you're selling your business, I, I, I look at the Arizona business brokers.com. I look at all the business for sale. I look at collections, revenue, overhead, and all that. Then I look at just your average dorky, dumb dental office. I mean, why would you sell a business in that protected environment, vertical, where nobody can compete against you unless they go to eight years of college? Why don't they just sit there and hire these kids from Ignite DDS and, and learn how to manage that thing from home? I mean, they're sitting there working 32 hours a week. They could have, they could have their, all, out of 168 hours, they could have a dentist work 32 hours, say, every day from six to one, and other dentists work every day from one to seven, five days a week, and be making two hundred three hundred thousand dollars a year and not even leave their home and and they want to sell their office pay half of in taxes and and put it into the stock market which is about the same as putting it in caesar's palace casino it's amazing yeah yeah i think most dentists don't no matter how long they've been practicing don't understand that their greatest investment is themselves and their ability to grow that practice and like you said bring people on expand their team and, and make it work for them. You're, you're, otherwise, you're handing money and rolling the dice. I always tell these young dentists the story of my uh, the uh, most amazing dentist I ever met. I just got out of school. I just got down here. There was like this 80-year-old German um, dentist lady, and she left uh, Germany because of World War II, and they had better dental schools there. She was Jewish. She fled. She came here, and they wouldn't recognize her dental degree because, you know, obviously Germany with shitty cars like Porsche and Mercedes yeah. and Volvo, obviously – their dental schools weren't up to speed. And they, they said, well, you, you can't practice dentistry. We, we don't recognize your school. And it was World War II, and she wasn't going to dental school. But a lawyer told her, yeah, you, you can't practice dentistry, but you can own a damn dental office. So what'd she do? She had to delegate 100% because the lawyers handcuffed her. And that was the and She said, when life throws you lemons, make lemonade. And that was the luckiest thing that ever. She, her ultimate nightmare, I can't practice dentistry. I don't have a job. I can't feed my family, turned out to be her greatest gift. Because when I met her, she was like 85, had four offices, north, south, east, west. Each one was doing a couple million. And I thought to myself, she was having more fun driving around at 85, checking on her little offices, richer than any dentist I knew at the time. And, uh, yeah, that was a great story. So, so what else the relationship? So, string fi- so disc. Now, can they go online to just disc.com and take the profile test and learn more about her? Or how can they do that? Sure. I mean, you you should you, make a course on that for Dental Town Disc. I would love to make that course for you guys with you guys. That'd be awesome, dude. I've seen you lecture several times in the last twenty years. I've ran into um, I, I don't know if it was profitable dentist or I, I've ran into you several times. You, you're you're uh you're and you're lucky because you got the whole tall, dark, and handsome energy, <laughs> charisma. I mean, you're just a hell of a speaker. I, I would love to have you get some courses on that um, on Dental Town. I, yeah. Yeah, I'd be honored to do that. That'd no, be- we put up 350 courses, and they've passed a half a million views. That's fantastic. Because on, online distance learning, because you know they don't have to close down their office, they don't have to fly, they don't have to travel, and they can, and they just want to do it an hour at a time. Yeah. And, and the research I'm reading on education on learning is that somewhere between 40 and 60 minutes, everybody starts daydreaming and dozing off, and. They need to go walk around, eat something, fart, go to the bathroom. You know, they're just, they can't sit there in a dental lecture from nine to noon and just take in information for three hours. That's not a way an yep. ape works. So, uh, so then, um, then you recommend getting the book Strength Finders for Leaders by Gallup. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and what, what, what other stuff for soft skills, people skills? I love generational learning too. You know, there's such a big difference from, you know, the traditionalist on down, so presently the millennial. And I think, you know, as a, a seasoned dentist, you know, a lot of times you might look at a, a, a Gen Xer or a Gen Y, or I'm sorry, and say, boy, they need to be spoon fed and they're doing this and they're this wrong and all this stuff. But let's face it, in the next two years, like this is the largest buying group in the U.S. It's the largest group in the workforce. And, you know, you flip the model and the millennials need to understand the boomers whose practices they're going to go in or the Gen Xers whose practices they're going to go in. So I really try to help people understand who the other person is sitting on the other side of the table at all times. I notice a lot of older baby boomers, they, they're looking at the new class of dentistry. You know, when I was a freshman in middle school, there was one girl in the senior class. 
now it's half women and uh a lot of the older guys they look at that and they, they just see that demography oh boy girl i see difference or they might be able to see race you know oh hispanic asian irish uh but it's really understand the the huge change in demographics is the huge change in how millennials think versus yeah. baby boomers and the baby boomers need to know how millennials think in order to attract and retain them into their office and the and the millennials need to learn how old farts like me think so they know what our scorecard is going to be and and understanding different generations of minds it's the same thing when you go to foreign countries you yeah. just ha you don't have any idea what you don't know that's like when i lecture international i don't do any humor i mean i'm doing i'm doing the uh the tempe improv tomorrow night or thursday night i mean i love doing stand-up comedy in my backyard and when i do the uh, when i do the improv i mean it's no holds barred it, it's just it's just horrible uh i hope none of it ever gets out on youtube but uh um but uh yeah, but when you go international, you, you can't make any kind of a joke because you don't you nope. don't know what the joke will mean. It could offend the whole damn room. So, exactly. uh, so what what else on relationship? Those are the big ones for me. You know, only because they're oh, so. Was there a book on that millennial generation X uh, baby boomer? Is I'll there tell you, anything uh, you read that succinctly describes that book the best? You know, there's there's a. There's not a book that comes to me immediately, but I'll tell you there's a great speaker that if I'm a, a boomer dentist or an ex-dentist, his name's Jason Dorsey. And Jason is... Uh, J-A-S-O-N-D-O-R-S-E-Y? Yep. yep. And exactly. wh where's he out of? Oh, gosh. I'm not sure, but he's big in the National Speakers Association, and he calls himself the Y guy. I saw him speak at a Crown Council event probably seven years ago. And this, I mean, he was, a, when I say kid, if he was 31 at the time, he was old. And he walked out on the stage in front of 1,300 people. And everybody looked at each other like, what is this guy going to teach me? And 10 minutes in, everybody looked at each other and said, oh, my God, what this guy's going to teach me. He was phenomenal. So any book that he wrote is a book I would read. Jason Dorsey. Jason Dorsey. So are you a member of the Crown Council? I am. How, how are those guys doing? They're doing great. They're doing great. That's they're, still they're, with Steve out of Utah? Yeah, Steve and Greg. Uh, uh, Greg's in Utah. Steve's in Dallas, Texas. But they're Steve Anderson. That's them. And his brother Greg. Yeah, Steve. The last time I talked to him, he had like four offices in Dallas. He does. I think he may have five or six now. And then, uh, and and that leads into the the other question we're talking about uh, the millennials, where the millennials need to read, understand this stuff, so they know how the old guys hiring are thinking. And the old guys hiring need to know how millennials are thinking, so they can uh, attract and retain and and keep them. Uh, but um, the, it seems like the people that are crushing us the most is Rick Workman with Heartland Dental Cares. I mean, he's hiring more dental school graduates than anybody out there. Is that because he understands the millennials? Or And, and what is your advice to all these kids with uh, $350,000 of student loans uh, for working in corporate? Because I notice you're in Albany. Uh, you're in Buffalo. Isn't that where um, Aspen is? Isn't Aspen right up the street from you guys? Where, where are they at? They are probably, there's maybe four locations here, so they're but 15 they're, minutes from us. But their headquarters is up there. And, I don't know where their headquarters yeah, is. Yeah, I think it's somewhere between uh, Albany, Syracuse, Rochester, okay. they're up there. But, what, okay. but what, what are you telling these guys about the Aswins, the Heartlands, the Pacifics, corporate dentistry? Because all the old farts, they have an office that's sitting there 168 hours a week, and they're open 32, which is 19% of the week, 81% of the week. Their patients are getting a voicemail. They're completely closed. And then those are the guys all bitching at Heartland for hiring all the dental student graduates. Like, well, at least Rick's giving them a job. You're, you're closed. You're, your patients are screwed, and you're not, you're not hiring the young kids. And, and in my generation, you know who, who uh, corrected that market failure? It was the Navy. Okay. Half my, you know, so many of my class went into the Army, the Navy. The Navy did the Marines uh, and the Air Force, so... So, so what, is your, what are your views on corporate? And what, what do you say when seniors say, should I get a job at corporate for a year or two or, or lifelong? What's your thoughts there? My, uh, my honest thoughts are, is always go in with your eyes open and understand that in any business, in any relationship, there's a give and a take. So when somebody's promising you all this, you know, they're promising you the world, there's a price that comes with that. So if you go in with your eyes open, it's not a bad place to go and knock out some debt. Um, statistically, it seems like three years in, a 
about 87% of them turn over, so they're not staying corporate for long periods of time. That's an interesting set I've not heard. 87% of dentists who go into corporate leave after three years? Yeah, so they're and, and I just want to make one little copy there, and not all of these corporate chains are created equal. There are There's a big corporate chain, yes. if I say his name, I got to go pay a lawyer $400 an hour, who hasn't, their, their average dentist doesn't say one year. So that would be, and that, and that's a, the question I recommend all associates when they go into a dental office. You know, they're, they're looking at three offices to get a job. My, my only question would be, what is the average employee worked in all three of those jobs? And if one's average two years, one's average four years, one's average eight years, there's no, then you don't ask about, well, they're going to pay this much and this percent, and I pay half my, screw all that stuff. Right. And if I was going to go work at a chain, I'd only have one question for each chain. How long does your average dentist stay here? And then uh, pick the longest one. And what's the only airline that's never had a uh, pilot uh, go on strike? Southwest Airlines. <laughs> and you, yeah. you go get a job at American United, it's just turmoil around the clock every day. All they do is sue their management team. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, uh, so, so you're telling them that it's a good place to get a job, pay down some student loan debt, and have your eyes open, and you'll probably be gone in three years? You know, I, I guess I encourage them to – I try not to – I try not to l l walk them down a path per se, because some of them have their own mindset, and I'm, I, I want to stay in touch with them. So if they walk the corporate path and they want to go to a traditional model, I want to make sure that we can reach out and drag them back to where they'd really like to be. They're a really entrepreneurial-driven group, so they, they truly want to own their own business. They just they haven't figured out how, and that's a large part of what we're trying to bring to the table is how you do it, whether it's a year out, two years out, eight years out. So. Okay, you're you're in there with these kids. Forty five out of fifty six dental schools a year. I, I don't know. I, I haven't heard of anyone with close to those numbers. I mean, I'd say my last. Uh, I started lecturing in nineteen ninety. I mean, I probably average like maybe six or ten a year. And you're doing forty five years. So so I want to throw out two things. Older dentists say they say, well, the women in dental school they they don't want to own their own practice. They just want a job because they're gonna they're gonna stay home and have babies. And then another group who's just really anti-millennial says, are you kidding me? Those kids are so damn lazy these days. They'll never run their own business. They all just want a job. What are you seeing? Do they want to just work a job? Do women dentists want just a job more than males? Or how many of them do you think deep down in their heart want to own their own show? I would tell you that over, I would say over 75% want to own their own show. They just don't know how to get from where they are to owning their own show yet. And men, women, it doesn't matter. The, the women dental students that I meet today, they are highly, highly driven. They have uh, something to prove. The who? Got, the women? The, the female dentists, yeah. They've got so, something. So you don't, you don't see them more likely to want to um, just have a job and stay home, make babies, um, as want to own their own practice? You, you don't see any difference in their, uh, between the males of want to own their own show? I'm not seeing that. I'm yeah. really seeing a lot of driven women as much as driven men. And... The more we get the message out that you can own your own practice and, as you say, not be in it every single day. You could be off speaking. You could be home with kids. You could, you know, teach at a school. There's, there's so many other options. You don't have to be there seven days a week. You just have to keep the practice up and running more frequently than people are doing it. Yeah, I, th I think you should just graduate from school and pretend that you're a Jewish immigrant from uh, Nazi Germany and uh, don't use your license. Just, <laughs> just pretend that you have this barrier to entry and just start delegating. Um, and, and, and another huge myth that's out there is that since they have $300,000 of student loans, they're not going to be able to get financing for a dental office. But when I talk to the four biggest banks in, the, in America and I go to their division that only does dentistry, physicians, and lawyers, they say, are you kidding me? Are you yeah. kidding me? We'll, we'll finance any deal. Just, I mean, there, so there's a total disconnect somewhere. Because the bankers are all telling me, dude, I'll finance it, you know, all day long. Mm -hmm. And then and then other people are saying, well, they're all working for Rick at Heartland because they can't buy their own practice. So yeah, I, so, I think somebody's, tell, some, somebody's misinformed. Yeah, I think it's so easy for... Um, are so are, easy are for you seeing these kids with access to finance for a practice? Oh, yeah. There's, like, I totally agree with you. If they want the money, the money's there. The money's there. And that's why yeah. we're the number one uh, economy in the world. We got, you know, it was a $70 trillion economy last year. $17 trillion of it was the United States, where only 5% of the people live. Because in capitalism, rule number one is get your people access to capital. 
and America does it with student loans, they do it with housing loans, and right now the banks are fully funded, and and all the top four banks are saying, yeah, you got financing, and that's what you're you're hearing too. So that is not an excuse for anybody. No. And and the other thing that that's so hard to teach a kid, they always think that if they buy the smallest, cheapest. <laughs> lowest price office they'll save the most money and i and i try to tell them well it's like a house i mean you could buy a a hundred thousand dollar house a four hundred thousand dollar house or a million dollar house and then when you go to sell it one's only going to sell for a hundred thousand and the one that's a million you're, gonna sell. you're buying a cash flow and if yeah. i was going to buy a cash flow i'd buy a big damn cash i'd buy the biggest damn cash flow somebody will find i'd rather go in and buy a million dollar practice all done with dentistry i can't do and hire one or two associates to do it all and then just sit home and and play Nintendo all day. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I'm, I mean, they don't, uh, they don't, they don't, they don't understand that your leverage is other people's money. And whenever you go to countries where you don't have access to other people's money, they, they it's it's a third world country. And if you yeah. have access to other people's money, and you can go buy a big cash flow business that's bringing in a million bucks a year and spinning off three, four hundred, you can cover your loan payment. You can hire someone else to do the dentistry. I mean. Business is business, and I think what they, I think the biggest mindset screw up in their walnut brain is they graduated from lawnmower school, so they think they have to push a lawnmower till they're 65, and they graduated from dental school, and they don't have to run a drill or push a lawnmower, and when you go open up a business that has, you know, like if, if I owned a lawnmowing service, I certainly wouldn't spend all day pushing a lawnmower. I'd be working on the business of lawnmowers. And uh, the, these kids go get a job because they think they have no access to capital. They have all the access to capital. They could all go buy a million dollar practice and have that corporation hire themselves as an, an associate and hire an office manager that's as rock and amazing as like Anastasia to just run the whole damn show. And then they could just sit there and take notes for five years while they're getting rich. Yeah. I mean, and I'll add to what you just said for where they are from a debt load standpoint, they go buy a hundred thousand dollar practice. It's not going to generate enough income for them. But they, if, but they save so much money. Right, I know. They save so much money. They went to the worst part of town where there were 40 dentists on the corner, and they saved a lot of money. Yeah. And, and then you say, okay, well, if you were going to buy a restaurant, would you buy a Roos Chris or a 30-year-old taco stand? <laughs> and they say, I, I'd buy the million-dollar Roos Chris. Okay, so why, why did you buy the taco stand then, dental right. office? Absolutely. So Okay, so relationship. So number three was what? Uh, number three is understand your finances, which is a lot of what we've been talking about and setting budgets. We try to, we try to help them create a budget. It's amazing to me how many people don't know how to balance a checkbook yet alone. If I have a, if I have two loans and one is a 20% interest rate and one is six, I should pay the 20% first. So we try to help them create a budget, understand fundamentals of, um, money coming in and money coming out. Um, talk well, about options for. But wasn't students. all of that already taught in their tooth morphology class? <laughs> yeah, first year in the basement. When, right after they covered the cusp of Carabelli, they went right into uh, profit and loss statements. Yeah, waxing and investing. I thought naturally <laughs> went to investing. You know, but I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Wax. Oh, that's I like that one. Oh my God. So so financing. So here, you know, here's another thing. You know, with my boys, um, I learned a tip from my dad. You know, all my friends when I was in high school had a curfew. My, my dad, I didn't have a curfew. My dad wouldn't know who I was with. And if I was with my boring friend, John Lees, who's now a dentist, you know, we went to dental school. He said, well, hell, if you're with John Lees, you don't have to come home. You stay out for 40 days and 40 nights. Then if I would have got my, my fun friend, Alan Funk, I'd be home at 9 o'clock. You know, nice. and, and uh, so um, eagles fly with eagles, turkeys fly with turkeys. And I still think, looking back, I mean, I signed up when I was young um, the MBA program, because I only lived 10 minutes from Arizona State University, and they had this, uh, it was either Monday and Wednesday night, 6 to 10 p.m. for two years, or Tuesday and Thursday, 6 to 10 p.m. for two years, or every Saturday. And what I thought was, that looking back, you know, I was with 200 kids, two nights a week for four hours, year-round for two years, and it was the classes, and it was going out to bars afterwards, and it was hanging around with 200 MBA guys, for two years in the 90s, and every single one of those kids exploded. I, I, I still almost think, you know what, maybe the first thing you should do is after you get your job and all that, sign up for an MBA program. And, 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 and who yeah. cares if it's a community, co the, the books are all the same. You could go buy the books and read them yourself. It's the hanging with your classmates for two years. 
You know, just just all this fret like like you. You like you're smart, charismatic, fun. You know, when you're when you're hanging around with the 200 kids like that that are all bright eyed and bushy tailed and trying to figure out the whole world from a smartphone to a whatever the hell. I mean, that was just that was so much energy. You couldn't have fit that in a bottle of Jameson whiskey. And I'm Irish. I mean, that, that, I, I still look back and think that was probably my second luckiest business move. My, my first one just being born from my dad who had nine Sonic drive-ins. I mean, that guy just he just ate, lived and breathed everything about business. But the second one was probably that MBA program. For sure. Because yeah. the information didn't really change me because, you know, uh, I just got G-rated terminology. Like my dad used to call it the BAM number, bare ass minimum. And I thought that might not be the correct term. And I found out it was the BEP break even point. So all, all MBA school did is change all the profanity terms to rated G Disney terms. But uh, what, what do you think about them going back to get their MBA? Do you think that's overkill or would you recommend it? I'll tell you, if, if they've got the drive for it and they can do it in a fashion like you're mentioning where you can go to work and then pick up your MBA over two years, absolutely. I think the information's power and, and, and as importantly, like you mentioned, the circles of people that you travel in, your first three to five years out, I think, absolutely shape the next 30 years for you. And that so, was the importance of getting my fellowship in the AGD. You met, you started hanging out with all the dentists in your tribal village who really wanted to learn and had an open mind. And a lot of times the instructors would leave and a lot of times I'd find out later that night at the bar that I didn't even understand what the instructor had said or didn't realize what he said was so controversial and just, just hang in with that group for five years to get your FAGD, then another five years for your, yeah, just uh, going to the, um, the Panky Institute. I mean, yeah. I learned far more at the evening in, in, in you know, in the restaurant and the, um, the, the dorms and the hotels, uh, staying all that, debating what you just learned. And then yeah. they, and they know that that's what they're trying to foster. They try to steer everyone into group dormitory sleeping arrangements because they know, that they're going to start the conversation all day, then you guys are going to go debate it till three in the morning. So those six to nine p.m. sessions that I went through, they were they were good, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. so is there any anything um, on finance that they can read? Is there any uh, low hanging fruit books that uh, kind of explain any, anything you like? Boy, I'd honestly defer to you. I think you probably would have so much more knowledge on the right book for them to read there than I would. Yeah, there's a lot of it. So what's number four on Crush? Uh, S's starts with you, so that's sort of our, that's our leadership track. Well, wait, wait, Crush, C was for continuing ed, R was for relationships, yep. finance, you said three was finance, what, where's the U? Understanding finance? Understand your finance, oh, yep. right, understanding Not finance. That. And then, so now we're at S, what's S? S's starts with you, so leadership and how... Whether we like it or not in our practice, you know, where we bring our team is where they're going to follow us. And, you know, attitude you bring to the table, who you are, how you, how you focus on your strengths and build that team around you, all so very, very important. And, and so the million-dollar question that everybody debates on leadership, and go back to that Gallup book, um, are leaders, are they born that way, way or are they, or, or, or can they be made that way? I mean, like, like I look at, say, look at some of these uh, Hollywood movie stars where they say uh, they, uh, that off the screen is great, the most boring person on earth, you know what I mean? But it, the, but they can play this robust, robust character. And and do you, and, and it's kind of what, what I always wonder about leaders, leadership. I mean, can you be an algebra question? But when you step in stage to your dental office, you're this 25-year-old leader. I mean, can you can you learn to be a leader, or are you born that way? Uh, you know, I, I believe two things. I believe that there are some some people where everything just comes so natural to them, and it's it's an easier path. But it's a learned skill set, just like you know, scratching enamel your first time you bust out the handpiece. It wasn't easy, but eventually you got the hang of it, and eventually most of us got pretty decent at it. So you can learn it. It's, it's those circles of people you mentioned early on in your career. You know, who are you hanging around with? Because odds are you're going to become so much more like them. So hang around with people who know how to lead. Find people who are successful doing what you want to do the way you want to do it and copy genius. And, and your, your favorite leadership book, Is It Strength Finders for Leaders by Gallup? I like that one a lot um, for them. I think that's a great place for them to begin to understand that we're not all good at everything and that's okay. And you know, as a young dentist, I, there were days I felt like I was proving myself to somebody. I, and sometimes it was an invisible somebody all day long and, and understand that 
hey, I'm pretty good at this, and that's okay. I don't need to know all the answers. I just need to know to ask the right questions and build a team around me to uh, help me learn as I go. I still think, and, and I can cite a dozen HBR, Harvard Business Review articles on it, I still think the number one trait that all great leaders have is humility. They listen. They listen to their customers. They listen to their employees. They listen to everybody around them. So they're always absorbing information. They also show that the uh, smartest CEOs are introvert because introverts listen. Yeah. And extroverts, they didn't even hear what their team. That, that, that some dentists should never even have a staff meeting because they go to a staff meeting and it's a staff lecture. Yeah. They get all their staff in there and just lecture at them for now. Some of them are so bad they bring PowerPoint. It's just like a present. It's like, God. You know, the IN team is, uh, and yeah, so I, I would just say humility. And if you ask anybody in America, describe a doctor or a lawyer. Where, describe an adjective. Would humility come up in the top 10? Not so much. Yeah, asshole might, arrogant might, cocky, yeah. conceited, know-it-all. You know, just the first 10 would be horrible. But, yeah. uh, but a Mother Teresa, Calcutta, humble lady come up, that wouldn't even make the list. Right. And all, and, and, and I also check them on this. I say, okay, so name, so in my lifetime, I was born in 62, uh, Walmart was started in 62. And of course, everybody knows Walmart is now Sam Walton. But another one that grew 30,000% was Walgreens. Name the CEO of Walgreens. Oh, I'm losing. No, nobody knows him. I mean, yeah. I, I've never met anybody because he was a short, fat, humble, bald yeah. guy operator, just listening to everybody and just an, a massive operator by listening and built a monster. Yeah. Out of just down to earth, humble. I mean, Sam Walton, his desk, his desk was a door sitting on two saw uh, bench uh, with those wood saw um, uh, benches. He had a door over a desk just to remind everybody. Oh yeah, I'm a billionaire and own Walmart, but my <laughs> my desk and my chair didn't cost ten bucks. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. Okay. So then, what's the H stand for? So the H is all about Howard. 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 Howard, I get the word. <laughs> All right, Howard. <laughs> what, what, what is the H? It's hone your team. And, and I think, you know, most dentists focus on their team within their four walls, but it's, it's an expanded version of that. It's, you know, having the, the right uh, financial planner, the right accountant, the right attorneys, the right advisors, the panky people, the crown council folks, all those mentors are... Um, the most critical part of your team, especially early on, because when you get them early on, you'll keep them for 30 years. So H is all about developing that team. That is, uh, that, and, and, and this CRUSH program is one hour, two hours, three hours? How long is it for you to give your, your spill? That's about two hours long, and we just put out, so we have a whole series of success guides. The first one is just coming out now, and uh, they're all titled CRUSH, and we're going to bring five different thought leaders to the table to represent each one of those categories. And I know you're a crazy busy guy, but I would love to have you do uh, a chapter in one for us sometime if you could. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Oh, I, I love dental students. I, and uh, yeah, in, anything you want me to do. So ignite. So it's www.ignitedds.com. Now, yes. a lot of my viewers, I, I don't know what percent are students versus old guys. Um, um, what, who is that site for? I mean, it would, I mean, would a would a fifty year old guy find anything on it for them, or is this, is this a kid site? I'll tell you, if um, if you're a student or a new dentist, your first ten years out, you're going to learn a ton. If you're a fifty year old guy and you want to learn a ton about your next associate, the person who's going to buy your practice this one day, one day, or just how your patient pay think, it's a great place to come by, by see, and and just ask and absorb um, what that next generation can do with you for you. Etc. Huh. Well, that that and is it a free site or does it cost money to join or what's what's that? No, we're we're a free site uh, in the moment with everything that we do. And then my 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 goal is to be a connector. So what I know is, although hone your team is hone your team, it is about Howard and Dental Town because it's we. My job is to bring people to the next level and and say, I know this much, but I know a lot of amazing people who know so much more so we're my job is to connect people to the right folks so we're well, free and, and building out I, I think some people um misread me or, or their own strategy general where they'll think well, well i don't want to come on dental town that's howard's site no it's not that i mean there's a howardfriend.com i you know I, I, the only way i can describe this is not to be arrogant but it's kind of like family guy 
and Seth MacFarlane. They're, they're two separate people. I mean, yeah, Seth MacFarlane owns Family Guy, but he also wants to do movies and host the Oscars or whatever stuff. And it is Dettletown, not Howard Ferran show or whatever. And I always think, I never think in fear and scarcity. I always think in hope, growth, and abundance. See, I mean, I look back, and here's another trait I can give these young kids to remember. I go back 30 years. All the dentists who went and played with all the other dentists in their, in their neighborhood, in their building, and all that stuff, over 10, 20, 30 years, they were the happiest, healthiest. They got help. They could have an upset patient go to the, uh, you know, they could send them down the street to someone else. I mean, they just had rich or rewarding careers. But all the dentists who, like, um, thought the guy across the street was a competitor. I mean, I've gone into dental offices where there's eight that I, I, I'm not even making this shit up. This is, this, this is absolutely true. There are dental offices in my Phoenix town where there's like eight dentists in the building. None of them have ever gone to lunch or dinner or met each other in a decade. And those are always the most miserable people. And so, you know, like, like when I have a dental magazine, um, you know, I, I interview dentists that are editors of other magazines and, and all that stuff. And it's like, I never met a dentist that went, read one magazine. How long are MBAs go? We read Inc., Fortune, Forbes, Econ. I mean, fear and scarcity is just, it's just a disease. We're all going to die. We're all going to be lowered in the same damn casket. And those who master the people skills, think and hope, growth and abundance, reach out, help everyone, meet everyone, be humble, listen, learn, they're all going to crush it. And that is, and you're crushing it. And I'm so, uh, I'm so thankful for all that you do for these students. I'm glad there's people like you doing it. I wish you the best of luck. If there's anything you ever need from me or Dentaltown or whatever the hell, um, do it. Um, I, I, I just think you're amazing. And tell Anastasia if she ever uh, gets sick and tired of Buffalo that if she married me, she'd live in Phoenix with golf courses and palm trees. And uh, it's so beautiful out there. She wouldn't even notice that I only looked one-tenth as good as you. You know what? She's like my ultimate proof that I'm a little bit of a marketer is, is getting a southern <laughs> to Buffalo, New York. <laughs> oh, man. And, and those the, – the, no, uh, and yeah, I, I can listen to a southern bell accent the rest of my life. Yeah. I mean, there's something about – when Australian women and Southern Belle women talk, I mean, it's just, you could listen. It's like a, it's like when you go to Europe, all the languages sound so brutal except for the French. And you yes. don't know a damn thing they're singing, but it sounds like they're singing a song. But hey, dude, uh, uh, David Rice. Oh, by the way, I'm not <laughs> Rice, you think, you, you think if someone's talking about David Rice, you would, you would be some Asian guy. Uh, how, how did, how did a, a, a gringo cracker like you get a last name Rice? They don't even grow rice in uh, in uh, the United States. Well, I guess they do a little bit in uh, Louisiana. They got some rice fields now. You but know how, how did you get a last name Rice? The greatest question in the world is is that my grandfather was about <laughs> 25 years older than my grandmother. Never said boo. We don't know where he's from or what what happened, but we just we wound up here. So, but was guess, was he was he Asian? No, no, he was. Um, to the best of our knowledge, the look <laughs> that he let us in on, he, he has uh, some German background, could have been some American Indian background. I have no idea how Rice worked into the Welsh maybe, but, but I, we don't know. Uh, well, you know what's funny is uh, back in the day, you know, when I was in Kansas and I used to ask my grandparents, like, what are we? They would say Kansan. And I'd say, <laughs> I know, but what is your ethnicity? They go, well, my, my mama was born in Kansas and her mama was born in Kansas and We've been, we've been living here for forever. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it wasn't forever. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you came from somewhere else a long, long time ago. But, uh, yeah, they, they absolutely. So when I got out of school, luckily when I moved to uh, Phoenix, it's like the second largest Mormon population outside of Utah. And the Mormons and their temples, they, they're huge into genealogy. In fact, genealogy.com is right out of Salt Lake City. It's just a cut and paste of the Mormon tabernacle choir, uh, you know, genealogy deal. And I went down there and I paid a lady to uh, do our genealogy. She said, well, I'd have to charge you. And I said, she's 76. I said, well, how much do you charge? She said, $4 an hour. So I'm <laughs> like, all right. So I gave her a $100 bill and said, go for it. And then it turned out later she needed a, uh, um, some, uh, a new uh, removal. I can't say for the HIPAA, but uh, some, some dental work. So I went in a couple thousand more. But anyway, it was kind of funny because at, uh, at two parents, four grandparents, and eight grandparents, I was still 100% Irish. Wow. Yeah, and the grandparents didn't even know. Yeah, I'm the ultimate mutt. I'm not sure where we're from. Parts unknown. That's where we came from. All right. Well, hey, David, seriously, I think your mission is um, valuable. I think it has purpose. I think it's probably probably has the most important mission. I mean, teaching a bunch of 50-year-old guys how to place an implant is one one-thousandth of important as you working with the next generation that's going to take over the sovereign profession. So 
in all honesty, I tip my hat to you. I love, adore, and respect you and your mission. And uh, if there's anything you ever need from us to help spread your word, you just let me know. I'm Howard at Dentaltown.com, buddy. Thanks, you. I really appreciate your time today. And tell your darling wife I said hello. I will do that. Okay, bye-bye.